Welcome back. I'm Barry Craig. If one were to ask students, what is it in Western Kentucky that is most important for the sustaining of life and civilization as we know it, they would probably answer the mall. My guests today would disagree. They would tell you it is water. They are Bobby Lee, a biology professor at the college, and Maggie Morgan. They represent a group called the Four Rivers Watershed Watch. Welcome to the program. Hi, Barry. Let's begin by telling our viewers what the Four Rivers Watershed Watch is. They have t-shirts here that I think that's rather good. Yeah, rather that's nice. nice. There, so. so if you join, you get a free t-shirt? Oh, uh, well, yes, you do. Well, that's an inducement. That's yeah. an inducement. Tell us what Four Rivers well, Watershed let me, Watch I, is. Well, I brought a, a question for you along with a couple of props here. And this is this is Mary Evans from the drinking water plant. Now she works for the EPA. When I would bring students over for um, a tour of the drinking plant, she used to have two bottles. And she'd say, which would you rather drink? This is probably a trick question, but, but I'm gonna go with that one. Which one, this one? No. Oh, this one. oh this one. Well, this one has um, Chinese tea in it, tea leaves. Oh, it was a trick question. I this see. one came from my toilet at home. So it's, it's, it's kind of just showing you that what you can see with your naked eye is it, it can be deceiving when it comes to what's in water. That's very effective. And that's what... Does, so anyone, does anyone guess the other one with the matter in it? Do they, would they rather drink this, this the other one with the tea well, leaves? Um, not often. Probably sometimes not. what she would put in is pepper and it would look even darker and sometimes yeah. worse. That's a very effective presentation. So what does your organization do? So we, are, we analyze water. We're looking for in streams and people's um, where they live. We're trying to involve them in becoming more aware of natural systems like you say, the importance of water that might be running through their property or just an area that they might recreate in, um, swimming, fishing, just playing around in. And so we're trying to help citizens that are interested in the uh, science behind it become citizen scientists. And so we offer training on how to analyze water. And we do this jointly with uh, Maggie is the coordinator for the basin team in the area and she works with the health department. Well, Maggie, you go ahead and tell us. Um, I work with basically any kind of group that's interested in water quality, helping them implement projects. Um, I actually work for a nonprofit through a grant from the Division of Water. And one and the, of- What's the name of the nonprofit? Jackson Purchase Foundation. Um, and one of our um, tasks as a basin coordinator is to assist watershed watch groups. So we assist the volunteers that are trained by Bobby and our other um, scientific advisory committee. And if they have questions about the results that they have or maybe we see some kind of anomaly in the data or notice that the bacteria is high and they, they want to do something about it, I can help them by coordinating with local agencies or the Division of Water to try and delve further into the issue and figure out what the problem might be. You know, again, and I, that is a very effective uh, way to do that. Now, when I was a kid, there was a, a creek near where I lived, and we loved to walk in the creek and play in the creek. Mm -hmm. And when my son was little, I used to walk in the creek and play in the creek with him. And I never really thought much about it, but you know, thinking back when I was a kid, there were tires, bottles, old cars. Uh, in, in, haven't we done a better job of cleaning up our streams than? Oh, hours? definitely. Since the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, you know, during my lifetime, we've definitely seen water get cleaned up. But it usually takes. Uh, per, an interested person, often a citizen, to let us know this is an area that we shouldn't be swimming in. Mm -hmm. um, recently, we, uh, we were training 
Boy Scouts and 4-H students on how to sample and look at things like insects to see if they're living in your water um, because that's an indicator of water quality. You know, if there's nothing living in your water, that's a problem. Right. So we want to get people educated and it seems like it's been effective as far as with the Clean Water Act and having people cooperate. So for instance, there's the health departments from every county, there's the natural resources groups mm -hmm. that we work with to try to see if there are problem spots. So an example, you know, we've been doing this for about 15 years and there's been some success stories mm -hmm. as far as helping keep the water safe. Um, one of the uh, counties had a problem with sewage going right into Kentucky Lake. And so there were lots of high hits on bacterial counts. And that's one of the things that citizens will get a sample of water and then it's delivered to the um, some professional labs like the Hancock Biological Station. Mm -hmm. And so where there's high hits, we notify and work with uh, different agencies and they'll do a more focused study. And if it's continuous, well then what ultimately happened was that um, they came up with some funding and got sewage pipes put in. So where we can find problems working with Maggie and the contact she has with uh, different agencies, we can hopefully fix that problem. Mm -hmm. Well, just uh, <clears throat> looking at it from the pure nuts and bolts, let's say, well, if this creek, for example, goes behind the subdivision, and let's say I move into the subdivision and, and this creek is the back border of my yard, and I look at the water and think, how safe is that water? What could I, as a homeowner, do at that point to have it tested? Well, we first off, we would um, ask you to go s to some training that we offer every spring and summer. Yeah, well, talk about that. What's the training like? Oh, the training's fun. Um, we have people come in and we give them the general overview like we're giving you now about Watershed Watch. We've been here doing this for about 15 years. And there are bottles sent to the volunteers and they fill the bottle with water from their stream like the one behind the subdivision you're talking about. And that gets sent off to a professional lab to see what's in it. So it varies what year we're doing it. Sometimes we're looking for E. coli. Um, during the spring, we've been looking at herbicide contamination. Mm -hmm. Now there's also some things that the um, volunteer does in the stream. So they'll learn how to measure for pH, how to measure for dissolved oxygen. Anyone that, that's had a fish tank knows you gotta check the pH. Mm -hmm. So, you know, life can only exist in a certain range. You don't want it to be too acid. You don't want it to be too basic. And then oxygen, you know, is all important for all living things. And so we'll also um, check sometimes for um, high nutrients that might be an indicator of some pollution. Typically, the, the pollutants you find in, in our streams, the Jackson Purchase, is there a typical type of pollution you run into? Bacteria and um, sediment. We don't actually, we measure turbidity, which is an indicator of sediment, um, but- so That's what, how still the water is? That is how, how cloudy. It's dirt that's uh, in the water. Right. Um, and that's actually the number one problem throughout the state. Two thirds of Kentucky streams are polluted by sediment. And it's not something people typically think of as a pollutant because you think dirt is on the ground. But um, any kind of bare area, bare soil has, if that sediment r runs into the stream or if you have um, the velocity of the water being really high and it runs against the water banks, the banks will degrade. Right. And when you have a lot of that sediment in the stream, it'll, cl it'll clog the habitat. It will actually affect oxygen concentrations. Um, it, it just, the effects of it are numerous across multiple different um, pathways, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. they, it, a lot of the nutrients that she had mentioned 
will kind of absorb to the sediment. So it's just, it, it's a big problem. But we also have a lot of problems with bacteria. Well, you know, you, you think of streams in the Jackson Purchase. <laughs> well, this creek, for example, the, the banks are dirt. Whereas in other parts of Kentucky, you actually have stone in there. And uh, does that, do we have a, a greater problem with sedimentation because of that, that we don't have? You think of, you, you cross from the Jackson Purchase into Livingston County or Lyon County, and you're getting into the limestone. Uh, is that a make the does that make the problem worse here the fact that there's so much dirt before you reach the the bedrock here i'm not sure that it makes it worse we have just a different type of geology here in right. general what what does make it worse is you know a lot of the the first inclination is get the water out fast and so people think let's straighten that stream channelization right that's going to get it out fast that's actually not something you want to do because during those high flow events that velocity is going to increase and those banks are going to degrade whereas if you had a sinuous kind of curved channel it's going to slow that water down and the other problem is the connection to the floodplain um, we need to leave the floodplain alone really we need to have that we need to not develop in it because you want that water to come out of the banks and spread across the floodplain during Well, now that, of course, has brought up the controversy about, about these dikes along rivers that in times of flooding, they didn't have to dynamite some dikes over around New Madrid, Missouri, because uh, they thought that was, you keep the water off your, pl but all it does is, is, from what you read, it makes some situations worse. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, the geology of the, of the Jackson Purchase, then, I mean, how does that play into it? This is, well, the Kentucky Flatlands down here primarily, and, of course, the big rivers are our main feature, the Tennessee, the Mississippi, and the Cumberland. How does that affect what you all do? Well, you know, our area has a lot of agriculture. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we don't want erosion where topsoil is being, it, by gravity, right. when it rains, swept into the... Um, waterways. There's multiple problems. One is, an example is your subdivision um, issue. Erosion can start oh, well, eating I've, away. I've seen it since I was then, a kid. Absolutely, it is. It yeah, is. Yeah, and, and yes. like uh, Maggie says, there there are maps that show floodplains, but even today, we have um, development that are that make proposals to create streets or buildings on this floodplain and they really shouldn't because in the long run it's protecting that developer because uh, the hundred year flood which it might not take a hundred years could come and suddenly you have a flooding issue with that building which nobody wants property gets damaged it ultimately becomes a cost so there's reasons that you need to protect the floodplain and not develop there. And because of our sediments, they we have um, we don't have that hard you know, limestone geology that you know east of the Cumberland has. We've got it's called loess as mm -hmm. as more um, soil that's blown over. So it makes it good for farming, um, and so that's why we have more farming here compared to the rest of the Kentucky. But that means we need to have some special care. So f there's a term called riparian, which is just a, the zone that tends to flood that you want to protect that's near a water body. So it's recommended, and we have worked with quite a few ag people mm -hmm. to try to keep those areas with trees or some kind of natural vegetation so the roots hold in the sediments mm -hmm. instead of that when it rains, you know, herbicides could get washed off, um, soils could get washed off. And we've all seen that, that yellow after a rain of uh, Kentucky waterways that ends up in the stream. That's, that's sediment and that's one of the, the issues is erosion. How can we really protect some of our topsoil, which ends up protecting the farmers, ends up protecting um, us who want to play in the um, creeks or walk along or fish in the creeks if it's a bigger one. Um, you know, my favorite place actually is to sometimes go hiking in the creeks. You know, no, no ticks and chiggers in the middle of, That's true. 
of the summer. Oh, yeah. And so you don't want to be um, in an area where there's herbicides or fecal matter or something like that. You, you, we want to make sure that people stay healthy. Well, is there a certain size stream that has to meet your criteria? I mean, do you all work with the Mississippi and the Tennessee and the Ohio and the Cumberland Rivers? We do have some volunteers that um, sample Tennessee and Ohio. Um, they actually sample by boat. Most of our volunteers do the smaller weightable streams. We do want the streams to flow throughout the year, especially in July, um, but that doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a, a whole contingent that's um, on the lakes too. Mm -hmm. they, they love getting their boats out and they check, uh, they like to sample by the marinas mm -hmm. to make sure that, you know, fish in there and that there's not any uh, dumping of of uh, toilets, portable toilets going on at the marinas. So, you know, they're actually providing a service, I think. Um, yeah. And it's free to become a member of our organization, Four Rivers. We do prov end up providing, after they go th through the training, they get free pH kits, um, oxygen meters, temperature, you know, thermometers and uh, t-shirts. And throughout the the years, I mean, again, we've been doing this for quite a while. We've had um, different types of materials that are given out, whether it's a 100 meter uh, tape, because that's usually for a stream, our sampling area is about 100 meters. So um, we've had some long-term members. Uh, we do this jointly with Murray State University um, Mike Kemp from the Environmental Engineering Department is a science advisor. So is the Hancock Biological Station. Both of those uh, places often have training along with West Kentucky Community and Technical College um, every s spring. Um, we've had some in the summer. And so Carla Johnston from the Biological Station, she's actually the volunteer coordinator. So she makes sure that people have their materials for sampling dates and we sample about three or four times a year and then sh if there's any questions um, just to especially for new volunteers she's kind of this the support person um, that's works on a daily basis with on different research projects down at the biological station so it's a coordinated effort there's the nature conservancy involved mm -hmm. Um, with Shelley Morris and so Hopkinsville Community College. Hopkinsville Community College um, is also you know our sister college um, we're co-chairing I'm a the chair and then um, Jason Arnold is a co-chair. So how far does the Four Rivers Watershed Watch region go? How far east do you all go? You mentioned Hopkinsville Mm -hmm. So you take in Trigg County and Christian County and... Our, the furthest watershed is the Red River watershed. Um, and that actually goes over into Simpson and Logan County. Right, down into Tennessee too. You mm -hmm. cross at Clarksville, that's the Red River. I guess that's the Red River Valley, but mm -hmm. probably not the one of the song, you know. <laughs> and we do have some volunteers from Tennessee that mm -hmm. have worked with us. And we're always actively recruiting new volunteers. Mm -hmm. I must say, before we go any further, when you, you keep mentioning the Hancock Biological mm -hmm. Station, uh, Hunter Hancock was two of the best teachers I had at Murray State. He was tremendous, from Mayfield, as I am, but uh, it didn't matter. He was a tremendous teacher. He was an educator in the truest sense. I, I, I'm not a scientist, I'm a historian, but I took field biology under him and loved that class so much I was going to take it again. You could take it twice mm -hmm. in the spring and fall, yeah. but he retired. But he was a tremendous, tremendous teacher. And I think he was an ichthyologist. I think it's fish specialist, mm -hmm. but just a terrific guy. And, and uh, he's, he's terribly missed. He was a wonderful professor. And every time I hear his name, I, always, I, I think of him all the time when I'm out in the woods walking around. Yeah, I mean, the Hancock Biological Station is still going strong. Every summer they offer classes. I, some of my biology students, I recommend, oh, go, go take a field class as they become junior, seniors. 
Um, I've, I've actually taken quite a few classes out there and thought about taking field botany yeah. um, twice. Yeah. Uh, because as classes are basically all in the field, you might have a little lecture in the morning. Oh, it, it was a terrific class. We, we uh, I commuted from Mayfield. The class started at seven thirty, but I didn't mind. And we would we would leave campus uh, and go out in various places. And there were weekend field trips. And he had this wonderful house down at uh, near Blood River in Southern Callaway County. And the last class, we came out to his house, and he and his wife Christine. We had breakfast and he took us. We, we saw summer tanagers, Baltimore Orioles, mm -hmm. yeah. all kinds of really rare birds. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had to know the phylum class order, family, genus, and species of all of them. And uh, I, I didn't think I learned much high school Latin. Apparently I did because <laughs> I remembered quite a bit of that. Mm -hmm. But he was, he, was, he was so aware of, of, of ecology and conservation, really before it became a big political mm -hmm. issue. He was just a terrific guy. So I always like to plug him whenever whatever I can. Uh. Well, you know, there's, that's what we're inviting people to do, is to come on out, and part of our training is outside. It's really to get you outside. And we have um, parents bring their kids, and this becomes an activity that you can do with your kids to go out and sample the water and see what, what kind right. of Right. things are in your water and they can become more aware of you know the whole issue of you know we all need water to survive and we want to make sure it's clean and then you know that helps our kids learn from what we know past conservationists like you say hunter hancock yeah yeah and again you know we, we were talking earlier about uh, the the best well, next to that, the best graphic example I saw of that was years ago. Uh, I was in Bowling Green for a conference and went out to the to the Lost River Cave, and at the time it it, it it was it was in awful shape. I mean, there was a Volkswagen Beetle inside it. I mean, just just horrid polluted, and everything was covered with this brown slime. Mm -hmm. It was just disgusting. And this guy said, "That's that's groundwater pollution. Is what that was." And I thought. You know, if, if the citizens of Bowling Green could be brought into that cave and shown that, they it, it really brought it brought it home. And we have done, a, and that is now a little park. Uh, Western had it, and it's now a little park, and it's it's cleaned up, and it's it's really nice. But if people were aware of that, and there was this tradition in Kentucky for years that what was a creek for? It was to throw trash in. Uh, oh, I could take you back in my youth and show you creek banks that were nothing but just garbage dumps. I mean, stoves, refrigerators, tires, car parts, all thrown into creeks. And we're doing a better job of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Kentucky has a lot of waterways. In fact, the Commonwealth has the second most freshwater systems in all the 50 states. Oh, I don't doubt it. Uh, so, you think in our area the, with the big rivers. Yeah, and, uh, and, you, and you and you talking about the, these streams, uh, uh, Bio de Chien down in, in the, that's a it, it, that's mm -hmm. a French name, uh, Bio of the Dog, and that that's a that's kind of a historic thing in the old Bion Creek bottom, and mm -hmm. of course Clark's River, uh, that, and uh, uh, it, it, it's a, I do think that that awareness is a lot greater, and, and you all are doing a great job of uh, I think of, that's of our main goal making public is awareness of it. Uh, because, as I said, going back to the subdivision, I would be curious to know. And as I said, I spend a lot of time trading. And you're right, walking creeks is, is mm -hmm. fun. You know, get your pair of rubber boots and go walking creeks. Can it's I fun. go ahead and show you what's on the back of my T-shirt? You may. Can we get this? I'm sure we can. All right. Well, if you go back, if you go hiking around, okay, you're gonna see different different organisms. Oh my goodness. And so this is some of what our training. Um, does is right. for you to be able to recognize different what we call macroinvertebrates, but everybody knows what a clam is, right? Or a crayfish. That's a crawdad. Yeah. And, or, or uh, crayfish. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and number ten is a scud. That's I right. Thought that was a missile, a scud <laughs> missile. You know. So. Yeah. Uh, and I'll and look at the. Uh, oh yes, the Latin terms. Uh, <laughs> gastropoda oh yeah that's great yeah yeah and so so some of these some of these um, insects can live in polluted 
pretty polluted waters with low oxygen levels because it, they're called, uh, one group is called a blood worm and it's actually a midge fly. Ooh. You know, it's one of these, think of a caterpillar turning into a beautiful butterfly. A lot of insects have an aquatic stage. Mm -hmm. And so before it becomes a fly or a midge fly, mm -hmm. it looks like a worm, only it's bright red because it's got hemoglobin in it. Hmm, blood worm makes sense. So if they're pretty hardy when, even at low oxygen levels because they can store oxygen and kind of hide out if there's some pollution coming down the stream. And so what you end up finding in some polluted areas are, I've seen areas that have thousands, but all they are are blood worms. And what you would see in a natural system are some, a mixture. Mm -hmm. You might find some blood worms, but you should also find some mayflies and caddisflies and stoneflies. And those mayflies are the ones that if you're a fly fisherman, you're trying to make your ties look like these right. mayflies. Right. Right. And they're, but they're sensitive to things like, you know, the sediments and erosion mm -hmm. that Maggie was talking about because they have gills um, along their um, abdomen and they can get clogged up. So hmm. they constantly, just like a fish, they have to constantly be interacting with the open water mm -hmm. for oxygen. And if those get clog clogged up, you know, they're not around anymore. So they're an indicator, actually, of, of clean waters. And sort of like with the, the, the bird, the, the canary in the mine mm -hmm. shaft, that type thing. That, uh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. canary drops down dead. Then you better get out. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, because the, the, there's no oxygen right. or there's bad gases down in the mine right. shaft. Right, right. So, yeah, we, we teach in uh, some of our workshops the um, how to identify which you, you sound like you really I loved identifying uh, Well, I birds. did. I still remember those. Quite a few of them. I'm, I'm amazed. I love that. Uh, we have about 30 seconds left. Please tell us how folks can contact you all if they want to learn more about the program. Well, we have a website. Mm -hmm. and um, Which is? The number 4, www.jpf.org. Okay. And um, all of our phone numbers are listed. I think all of our phone numbers are listed on we'll there. Well, give your phone numbers anyway, just in case, to, if you can right now. Okay. It's 270-559-4422. Um, Mine uh, phone number is 270-534-3237. If you're interested in becoming a volunteer, again, it's free, and we'd be happy to have you. And the T-shirt's got to be the inducement. Oh, I mean, yeah. You've got to have a cool T-shirt to... To do that. So, so, Barry, are you going to become a volunteer? We need some. I'd like to. I'm retiring. I, have I know to keep you're me, retiring. I've got to have something to keep me yeah, active. And, so and you I know, do. we only have one volunteer in Graves County. Well, I'll try to make it two. Good. We're out of time. Thank you all for okay. joining us. I'm Barry Craig. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time.